Now, when we talk about fear of speaking in public, people you know, automatically think of speaking on stage. It's like, well, I don't do any of that. But let me take you a step into a different world where you do speak in public. So imagine the presentation that you have to give at work. Now, you may not stand in the CEO's office and you may not have to talk to the whole group. You may not have to do the big presentation. You may not have to do your slide deck, but you may have to be speaking in what they call the team huddle, that first 10 minutes of the day where you have to talk about your day or maybe it's half an hour, talk about the day, talk about what's going to happen and talk about what the plans are. I know lots of people in those freeze. The fear comes over them and they get all tongue-tied. I know that it happens. What about actually even speaking to people in the tea room? I have gone into tea rooms in the in organisations I've worked for and I've watched people get tongue-tied in those sort of situations as well. So I really want to spend the next couple of weeks leading up to the masterclass talking to you about this and I invite you to come along to the masterclass because the masterclass is going to be very focused on helping you to get rid of this fear, understand where it is, understand where it came from, and actually break through it. So let me just tell you a quick story. When I was, gosh, it must have been 16, 17, it wouldn't have been much older, and I worked in the bank. That was my very first job out of school. And for, I don't know how what the frequency was, but we used to have to take a turn at giving staff training. We used to have to teach some of our colleagues about something that we did in our job and something that was part of the job that I did in all honesty, I used to ring in sick every single time. The fear of speaking in public and the fear of speaking, it wasn't, wasn't even what you call in public, it was to the group that I was working with. They were all young people like I was, and they were some like still grown-ups or adults. There certainly were some people who were far more adult than I was, but that fear of actually standing up in front of them and talking openly. And, and, and speaking in front of them was worse than the telling off I was going to get from my boss the next day when I showed back up again. And I did it. And I, I remember him. I still can see him. I remember how angry he was. And next time it came around, it was my time to deliver this training. The fear of standing up in front of that group far outweighed his bollocking the next day. And I did it. So eventually, obviously, I left that organization and moved on. I also had when, so I have an awards night. Um, I, I sponsor a, a Women in Business Award. I've been doing it for a number of years now. And even now when I go up on the awards platform, because my job as the sponsor is I get to present the awards, I get to speak about the awards, and I get to, you know, have a bit of a, a, a public platform and there's a podium and there's lights and there's people and lots and lots of people. Every time I got there, I'm perfectly fine up until the day. When I start to walk up on that platform, I feel it. I can feel the tension and the tingling in my body. I can feel my palms going sweaty. I can even hear my voice starting to get faster and faster. And I laugh and I go up there and I say to them now, I'm the tapping lady and I'm just going to tap for a second because I need to calm all these nerves that I've got going on because I know that they're there. So what is it? What is it that gives us this response, which what what is it in our bodies that actually has us freezing, wanting to run? The, it's the fight or flight response in your body. It is that that same response in your body to when the tigers wanted to eat us and the bears wanted to eat us and anything else in the world wanted to eat us. It is the same stress response in the brain that is activated when you have to go and speak in front of other people. So let's have a conversation about what it actually is. It can be right the way back, and it comes from many, many spaces, but let's take it right the way back to what happened when you were a kid in school when you spoke up in front of people. I can remember getting told off, we were going through the alphabet. Um, I mean, God, Donna and Ruth, if you're listening to this, we were in the same kindy class together. And I remember going through the alphabet, and I, I, I've always been a wordy kind of gal, and we got to, you know, she told us four letters and I got to Z and it was Z for zebra. And I spelled it out and she told me off. The teacher told me off for, for going ahead of whatever her class was and saying this Z for zebra or whatever it was. And I still remember that to this day. And I can, I can even remember what she was wearing. So when we think things don't have an impact, they actually do. 
So is it that somebody laughed at you or told you off in school for, for basically showing up, sticking your head up, you know, being being seen? Did someone laugh at you or ridicule you or scold you? Or was it, you know, somebody else in the class got laughed at? Was it that, that seeing that someone else got laughed at and ridiculed, your brain's going, like, I don't want that to happen to me. So you pulled yourself in a little bit. You pulled yourself small. Could it then be that you got scolded at home? Was it not safe at home to, to be seen and to be boisterous and loud and known and show your face? Sometimes for us in our, in our households we grow up with, that's the impact that happened. It hasn't been safe. You were told you were wrong or, you know, who do you think you are or, you know, that's ridiculous and you wanted to dance and sing and you were told to sit down and shush and all those things have an impact when we get into adult age. Is there then an expectation for us as parents with our own children? Is there a boss that you're working for who has expectations? And when we can't meet those expectations, there is this response in us that goes, well, I'm going to get it wrong. And then our brains go back to, well, what happened when I got it wrong when I was a child? And I know it always seems where people go, do we have to go back to childhood? You don't have to, but so much of our our triggering today so much of our patterning today and so much of the way we show up today comes from that childhood stuff now it may not be that it was you know someone scolded you or laughed at you and ridiculed but it could have just been that you came from a very a very structured environment a very highly driven expectations of how you were meant to behave you may have been like me I was always boisterous and gregarious and oh my god I was always loud and noisy and that's not who my mum and dad and my brother were. They were all, all a lot quieter than I was. So there was, you know, often in, in, in childhood, we are, we are meant to fit into a particular box. So when that box doesn't feel congruent to us, there can be this level of anxiety. I know when I came out of my first divorce, there was an element of I'd done a, I'd done a psychological profile with a counsellor. And it was the dope one, which is the dove, the owl, the peacock and the eagle. If you, you don't know what the dope test is, go and, go and Google it. It's just a way of segmenting the community into four of, of how people behave. But the birds are kind of easy to understand. I said, there's the, there's the dove, there's the owl, there's the peacock and the eagle. So when I did that and she said to me, you are definitely a peacock, you are definitely out there, you are definitely Gaberi, and you are definitely a lover of attention and, and look to, to seek attention and be out front, I burst into tears because in the marriage I had been in for 20 years in that relationship, that was so frowned upon. So while I didn't have a lot of stuff that came from my childhood, perhaps, in that marriage, I did. That's where a lot of my triggers were. So in the masterclass that we're going to do on the 6th of, no, try again, the 7th of December at 6 p.m., we're going to come together in a masterclass. I'm going to help you to figure out what some of your triggers are. I'm going to help you to figure out where they came from. And we're going to do some work on releasing them in that actual masterclass. So today, what I want to finish up with is I actually want to do, I've got plenty of time, I actually want to teach you some tapping so that if you are between now and the masterclass, if you are triggered or you do have to speak in someone or I don't even have with you, you need to pick up that mobile phone because you're in business and you need to do a live like I'm doing or you need to do a video that you're going to post. And sometimes it's even just those static posts. And we have this overwhelming thought that runs through the head and it's who's going to judge me? What are they going to say? Am I going to look stupid? I did one this morning purposely in with my with my total bed hair. I, th I think it was neater than my usual bed hair, which is a bit like a scarecrow. And I had my jammies on. I had zero makeup on. I'm known for my red lippy. I had no lippy on. I had nothing. And I did that on purpose because we overthink, particularly as gals. What does my hair look like? What is my lippy doing? Guys, they just pick up the camera and just and talk. Beautiful for them. We need to replicate what they do. We, we need to do that not caring stuff what they do. But what I wanted to be able to do is to give you some tapping that you can do between now and the masterclass so that when that happens for you, you can get some relief, okay? So if you're brand new to tapping, just humor me and tap along with me. Whatever I say, you repeat and just echo it. And wherever I tap on my body is where you're going to tap, all right? It's as simple as that. No thinking, just feeling. So here it would normally be you tap on here. So even though I'm not feeling very safe in this moment, I deeply and completely accept myself. 
even though I'm not feeling very safe because I have to speak in front of these people. And I find that very confronting. I can deeply and completely accept myself. Even though I have this fear and I can feel it in my body, I can feel the adrenaline. I can feel that rush. I am going to deeply and completely accept myself. Now, if you don't want to do the side of the hand, if you're in the moment when you're triggered, if you don't want to do the side of the hand, you can get away with not doing that. But what I'll invite you to do is simple words. And it may be, I'm just going to go through them all, just I am safe. Through the points, I am safe. Just breathe. I am safe. 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 You can do under the arm if you want to. You don't have to under the arm. It's just in sort of just below the armpit. That is one way you can do it. There is another way and another three. And the reason I'm giving you three, three words, you only need to remember three words. But all of them have I am. This one is I am fine. 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 Pick whichever of the three. The last one I give people is I'm okay. 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 Now, what I get clients to do when they come to me and they've got, you know, because obviously between sessions they will be triggered and things will happen. I get people super easy flat palm here. And it doesn't matter what happens in your day, something triggers you, something upsets you, someone says something, you've got to go and talk to people and you feel the tension. Just here, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Or I'm okay. I'm okay. And if you do a mix them, it's fine. I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm safe. I'm okay. And if you do it here, you don't have to worry about am I getting the right point because you're going to cover the points. You don't have to worry about am I doing all the fancy words of your people who look at it on YouTube. None of that. Just acknowledging I'm fine. I'm safe. I'm okay. Now, for me, when I used to be in a workplace and I get triggered in the workplace, I would just take myself off to other one of the little rooms or I'd walk down the hallway and I would just be like this under my breath. I'm fine. 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 I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I would just do that. I would maybe walk outside, I'd walk into the bathroom, wherever it was. I just found this was inconspicuous enough that nobody noticed, nobody took any, paid any attention. It was just something I did because people, it's not uncommon for people to put their hand up on their chest up and stuff. So there are those three things that you can do if in the moment you're triggered, in the moment you've got to go, you're going to pick up that phone and you're going to do that Facebook Live because, you know, that's the right thing to do for your business. You have a message to share. You can do that. A couple of minutes of tapping. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. You have to go into your boss's office and you don't know what it's about. I'm fine. I'm fine. Tap all the way to his thing. Just be recognizing that these things are from childhood. There has to be a trigger. And the reason I was talking about there has to be a trigger if I'm not afraid of exactly the same thing you are and everyone on the planet's not afraid of the exactly the same thing you are, that tells me that it's something that happened to you that's caused the trigger, that's caused the, the reaction in your body. Of course, if you've got questions, pop them down below in the comments, whether you're watching the replay or whether you're watching this live. If you pop questions in here, we will gladly answer them for you. And I will see you next week.